Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Calculus. My name is Curtis Brown. I'm your host with Steve Kokoska and Tom Dick. Tonight we'll be talking about derivatives of uh, trigonometric functions and checking those things out. I know Steve and Tom have uh, prepared quite a bit of cool stuff for us to, to chat about. So Steve, I won't chat too much here. I'm going to let you take it away. You ready? Yes, sir. Here we go. How's that looking? Okay. Looks great. All right, I'm gonna try to make that full screen so it's even a little bit better. And let me turn this around here. How about that, okay? Looks good. Okay, thanks Curtis Looks for good. arranging everything again. Uh, before I get started here tonight, I do uh, think we should thank Mark Corrali. He's done a, a great job promoting all of this and sending both Tom and I some questions. So uh, thanks to him and he's done an awful lot in support of AP Calculus teachers. And I also wanted to thank our friends up in Canada for joining us tonight. That's kind of nice to see. So tonight we're gonna talk about derivatives of trig functions. And Tom and I have done a lot of webinars for you, Curtis, but we haven't had the chance to talk about this topic, I don't think. And this is one of my favorites. So I'm gonna start out with a, with a problem here, uh, kind of a, uh, what I would call an inquiry-based learning example. I've actually done this example on one of my trips over to China. I really, I really like this one. There's a lot of cool stuff going on in here. And so my objective is, let's have, suppose we take a look at the function uh, f of x equal to the sine of x, and I'd like to try to figure out what the derivative of the sine of x is. Now, before I take a look at these graphs here, uh, I'm going to assume that the sine function is defined uh, for all real numbers x, and it's understood that when we ask for the sine of x, that means we want the sine of an angle whose radian measure is x. And let me just step back for a second, Curtis. You know, this is still a, a relatively common error on the AP calculus exam where students will accidentally leave their calculator in degree mode versus radian mode. And Tom actually, I think when he does a little bit with technology, will uh, show you something along those lines. So similarly for the other remaining trig functions, uh, we'll assume that they are, uh, that their argument is uh, all real numbers and they're in, uh, assumed to be in radian measure. Well, again, this is one of the coolest derivations for me because we can actually look at this graphically. We can look at it numerically if we wanted to, and we can finally do this analytically. So what I've done up on the top graph here is I've started with a graph of y equal the sine of x. And what I'd like to do is to draw some tangent lines in here and take a look at the slopes of those tangent lines and kind of connect them with a smooth curve down below to get some idea of what the derivative of the sine of x might look like. So the easy ones, of course, are where the tangent line is horizontal. There the slope is zero. You can see that one. You can see this one. Here's a couple of them where the slope is zero. And OK, a little literary license here. But if I draw the tangent line in there, it's in maroon. I don't know if you can see that on your screen. But that actually has a slope of minus 1. So that means the derivative goes through this point down here. So, okay, I can do that for a number of points. I can do that, draw that tangent line and estimate the slope of the tangent line, connect the points, and I get a curve that looks a little bit like this in green down below. And that would be my estimate for the derivative of the sine function. And that looks pretty familiar to a lot of us. Now, when I hand it over to Tom, he may take a look at this uh, on the TI Inspire and maybe even how to do this in general, uh, but we'll leave that, we'll leave that for uh, later. So I like to say, well, look, if I really want to find the derivative here and I don't have anything else, any other way to do this exactly, all else fails, I go back to definition. And this is one of the coolest derivations, I think, because there is so much going on here. Uh, my screen is probably going to get a little messy, but let's take a look at this. So to find the derivative of the sine x, I'm going to go back to definition. And here's our definition of the derivative, the one that I'm going to use. The limit as h goes to 0 of this quotient. And then in this next step, I'm just going to use the definition of this function f, which is the sine of x. I'm going to circle this. And I'm not supposed to write down anything that's wrong. So I won't write this on the screen. 
But you know, a common error is still to think that that expression is the sine of x plus the sine of h. And of course, that's not true. Now, there are some functions where you can indeed take a look at f of x plus y, and it is equal to f of x plus f of y. And why don't we leave that as our first open question out there, Allison, if you're still with me, if anybody knows the answer to that. When is that true? So I'm going to sneak up at the top here and write something like this. When is f of x plus y? When is that true in general, if you know? So, all right, my next step here, and again, I told you my screen is going to get see, a little we bit didn't messy. See that. Up at the we top. We didn't see that where you wrote up there at the top. Your pen didn't. Uh, up at the top here? Your pen didn't write up there. Huh, how about oh, that? Or did you write it in white? Um, no, I didn't I write it, it in white. How about that? Can you see this arrow that I'm writing now? Now I see it. Okay, there you go. Just took a while to catch up. Okay, so in this next step, I've added a couple of reasons off to the right-hand side, but in this next step, I'm gonna use a trig identity, the sine of an angle plus an angle, and I think I've done that correctly. And again, another arrow here, I'm gonna bring down this sine of X, there it is. And we've gotta think a little bit about what to do in this next step, but what I'm going to do is I'm gonna write this as two separate fractions. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna combine this term and this one into one, and I'm gonna bring that over here. And then I'm gonna bring this term, this product over here to this second term. So I don't know if that's an intuitive step or not, but after some fumbling around here, there isn't too much more we can do. Now I've got two separate fractions. In my next step, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna factor this right here. I'm gonna take a sine X out of both of those terms. And in this expression, I'm gonna, isolate the cosine of x. And one of the reasons that you might think to do that is because this is a limit as h goes to zero. And therefore any expression with an x in it, like the cosine of x is actually constant with respect to that limit. Now in the next step from here to here, I'm actually gonna use a couple of limit laws. And now this has come up on the Facebook page a couple of times. So I wanna make sure I get this right. First of all, the limit of a sum is indeed the sum of the limits, but we can only do that if both of the limits exist. Now, I'm a little unsure if these limits exist yet, but I'm gonna convince you that they do in a minute. Now, the truth is that I really don't need to write this limit because again, the sine of X is constant as H goes to zero. So I could indeed just get rid of that limit symbol if I wanted to. And I could do the same thing here. A limit of a product is the product of the limits if both of the limits exist. But again, this is constant with respect to this limit. So I could get rid of that if I wanted to. So now I'm stuck with these two limits, this one and this one, two very important limits in calculus. And I'm gonna put a little star next to my messy screen here. That's the really important one. Now, I'm not going to go through this one with you in gory detail. Curtis, that would take a whole nother hour to do, and I know we don't want to do that. There's some nice graphical evidence of that, but I'm going to add a little bit off to the side, and these are some questions for our participants also. In showing this or estimating about what that limit is as h goes to zero of the sine of h over h, I think you can take a look at this and convince yourself a little bit about this limit. If you take a look at a couple of graphs and I'll leave that as a question for participants. Can you tell me what graphs you might take a look at in order to estimate that limit? And a second way that you might convince yourself of this limit is, especially for the BC students, um, I guess I'll just put that BC with a question mark how about the BC students that probably not at this point yet in the semester, but there is kind of a cool way that you could convince yourself or estimate this limit. So anyway, there's three different ways here. There's a nice geometric argument that most calculus books, most AP calc books go through. The, there's a nice graphical way that we can look at this zooming in and convince ourselves. And for some BC students, we might be able to take a look at another way to estimate this limit. 
Some of you out there, I'm sure some of the instructors, some of the teachers are thinking about L'Hopital, but remember, we don't have that. We don't have that method at this point in the class. So anyway, the conclusion is that this limit is equal to one. In addition to that, we can take a look at this limit as X goes to zero. And again, another question for participants, how do you prove that limit? Anyone know how to do that? And I'll give you a little bit of a hint here. We want to multiply by one in a convenient form. So we want to take this expression, cosine of x minus one divided by x, and we want to multiply that by one in a convenient form. And that's a nice way to find that limit. So Allison, I don't know if you're getting any answers yet, but there's at least three or four questions out there. One up in the top right, I hope, uh, Curtis, you can see that now. Two down here, how do you find this limit with a graph? Maybe some of our BC students could give us an idea. And how do you prove that limit by multiplying by one in a convenient form? So, so anyway. um, looks like we haven't gotten any answers uh, other than somebody talking about Taylor series. Very um, good. That's an excellent, on excellent that suggestion. Yep. We could indeed take a look at McLaren series here. That's a very good answer. Whoever did that one, they deserve a new calculator. I think Curtis. That's a very good answer. <laughs> and maybe we can leave the others as open. Right. Okay. So finally putting all this together. Oh, Mark Crowley also jumped in and said that uh, y equals one and uh, one minus x squared looks like would be good um, solutions as well. Um, I'm not sure about that one. Mark's going to have to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, I was thinking of here. I think that if we take a look at the graph of y equal x, and simply what, whoops, I'm sorry, simply y equal the sine of x. And we take a look at those two functions near zero and we zoom in. It turns out that yeah. near zero, they look almost identical. And therefore there's some graphical evidence there, I think to suggest that this quotient does indeed go to one as x goes to zero. Certainly so there's based a lot on of those. Stuff. Yeah, there's a and lot also, of- Also, we did get some comments around L'Hopital's rule. Um, Alejandro uh, puts that in um, and a couple others, so. Okay, cool. So now I'm gonna put all this together. I've got this limit here equal to zero. Whoops, I erased a little bit there. I've got that equal to zero. I've got this limit equal to one. And finally, we've got a proof here or a derivation of exactly what we thought was true. We found that the derivative of the sine is the cosine. So given that, it opens up all sorts of new problems that we can do with our students. So let's take a look at an example, a sign of the times. I think this is kind of a nice AP calculus question. This is a kind of a typical, I think, question you would see on a traditional multiple choice portion of the exam. I've got f of x equal to x cubed times the sine of x, and I want to find the first derivative. So I've got to use the product rule. I'm going to sneak that in. I didn't add anything off to the side on this one in blue but I'm gonna to have to use the product rule here in order to get this. So I take X cubed times the derivative of the sine plus the derivative of X cubed times the sine of X. So there's X cubed times cosine, three X squared times the sine. I did a little bit of simplification, but of course not necessary on a free response portion of the exam, but maybe necessary on a multiple choice portion because you don't know exactly how that answer, how those answers, how the correct answer is going to be presented. And just to sort of support this, because we're do a, we do a lot now, remember numerically, graphically, here's a graph in blue of y equal f of x. Here's a graph in green of y equal f prime of x. And I like to, with my students, convince them that, you know what, this is indeed the derivative because, let's see, as f is increasing, the derivative is positive right here. F turns around and is decreasing, F prime is negative, and I might work through this with my students. That's kind of a nice graphical support of the analytical result. So cool. I like that. 
I get making you. connections between that graph uh, and the analytical result is, I think, crucial for students, especially like me, um, <laughs> who, <laughs> who the graphical is so much more compelling uh, than the analytical uh, responses. Um, it's so much easier for me to see it and experience it that way uh, than to try to, to hang through the, the analytical. I can, I can see the analytical sort of, but it's much easier to see the graphical. And, I, and I'd like to also add that, you know, with technology, that makes this a whole heck of a lot easier. Yes. You can imagine 20, sure. 30 years ago, trying to graph something that, like this without technology, it's very painful, doable, That's but true. very painful. Yep. That's true. All right. So let's go take a quick look at one more derivation, and then we'll look at some of these other derivatives a little bit quicker and easier. Let's find the derivative of f of x equal to the cosine of x. Once again, I'll go back to definition. Here we go. Similar expression to last time. In this step, I'll use again a trigonometric identity. And then once again, I'm going to combine some terms judiciously here. I'm going to factor out a cosine of x. I'm going to factor out that sine of x. And again, for the same sort of intuitive reason, because I have a limit as h is going to 0. So it sort of makes sense. I want to isolate expressions that are constant with respect to that limit. So the cosine, again, comes out. Or I have a, uh, a limit law. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. This limit, again, we found a minute ago was 0. This limit we found a second ago was 1 and son of a gun. The derivative here is minus or the opposite of the sine of x. So that's cool. Very cool. So I have another question here coming up in a minute. Uh, I'm going to use the quotient rule here to find the derivative of the tangent of x. I certainly don't want to go back to the, to the definition. Um, I would just add, I think, Curtis, that this is a, a, a nice problem that I think your students can do. This is nice practice. Once you've got the derivative of the sine and the derivative of the cosine, this is good practice with the quotient rule, good practice with notation, sure. notational fluency. So we use the quotient rule. We bring the cosine up. We need the derivative of the sine. There's minus the sine of x times the derivative of the cosine. So a little bit of derivatives in here. Yep, there's the derivative of the sine, which is the cosine, derivative of the cosine minus the sine. And son of a gun, there's a trig identity in here. Cosine yep. squared plus sine squared. That's one Woo. over the cosine squared. And that's the secant squared of x, which is very cool. I love so, this process of, of, you know what, getting a couple of things that you know down pat then being able to derive the things that you um, that you don't necessarily have down pat, right? Agreed. I like that. I agree. I agree. It's a good test strategy too. So that means we can now find the derivatives of all the trig functions. And Curtis, at a lot of the workshops I get, uh, teachers ask me, look, do our students have to memorize these? And you know, the truth is, they, they really need to know these down cold. Look, would they ever have to derive one of these on a free response portion of the exam? Look, I doubt it, but they really need to know these cold. So we did these three derivatives. I think your students could do this one in a similar way with the quotient rule. Um, look, you can actually use the quotient rule to get those two, to derive those two, but there's probably a better way, a sneakier way to do that. And why don't we put that question out to our participants tonight? How would you find the derivative, for example, of the cosecant of x or the secant of x without using the quotient rule, without going back to the definition of the derivative? So we'll leave that as sort of an open question, and I'll come down here. That's a nice question. I'll come down here and do a couple more examples. So I think this is another nice AP question, uh, probably for a free, uh, pardon me, probably for a multiple choice. But again, how do I find the derivative of this function? Well, again, I have to recognize that I use the quotient rule. And I'm going to scribble a little bit off to the side here, Curtis. You know, some students on the AP exam will see this and they will rewrite f like this they'll rewrite it as something like x squared plus one to the minus one times the cosine of x. And I get this question frequently, is that okay? Can I write it like that? And then take the derivative using the product rule. And the answer is yes, of course you can. 
But in my opinion, that's a little bit harder. I think it requires a little bit of extra simplification at the end. And you know what, that can lead to more errors. So I think, I think the best way to do this, to attack this is with the quotient rule. So here we go, we bring the denominator up, derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. Let's see, there's the derivative of the cosine. There's the derivative of that polynomial, just two X. And I did just a little bit of simplification to arrive at that. I won't do this, but I think uh, that if you're going to use any of these problems in class, I think it would be really cool to graph again, this function F and F prime and convince yourself uh, that indeed you do have the derivative. And by the way, this is a really good example, I think for technology and simply practice entering a kind of a complicated function in y1 of x if you're using the 84 or even if you're using the inspire to make sure that you have the numerator correct all of the products correct that you really do have this quotient that's just good practice yeah it's good practice with a math print too right being able indeed. to use that that's good indeed yeah indeed all right, I'm going to do one more. Um, please bear with me on this one, Curtis. This has uh, some nice, uh, I think, uh, some nice symbolic answers. I don't know whether Tom's going to look at this or not on the TI Inspire, but any of you who are using a CAS system might consider this one. And I uh, make sure, Curtis, before I leave this problem, that I do indeed mention a little bit about the numerical answers here. So I want to find an equation of the tangent line to this graph, uh, the graph of this function, that's an x squared minus x times the secant of x at x equal to pi over six. So looking ahead, I know that in order to find an equation of the tangent line, I need a point and I need the slope. I've got the x coordinate, I need the y coordinate. So one of the first things I did before I really did any calculus was I tried to evaluate this function at pi over six and holy Toledo, Let's see, it's pi squared over 36 minus pi times the secant of pi over six. Let's see if I got that right. That's one divided by the cosine of pi over six. So one divided by the square root of three over two. So I think that's right. And I did yeah. a little bit of simplification to get that symbolic y value. Now I've added in off to the side here, there's the numerical equivalent in AP calculator, numerical equivalencies to three digits, three places to the right of the decimal. So I'll just remark here that if we were to ask a problem like this on a calculator active portion of the exam and the free response portion, it would certainly be okay for students to give us a numerical value of y to three decimal places. All right, so here's the derivative. I'm going to use the product rule, x squared minus x, derivative of the secant, derivative of that polynomial times the secant. There it is. I don't want to do any simplification there. Jeepers, I don't even know if I can. I'm going to plug in pi over 6. Here it is. I don't expect you to, to read all of that. Three dots, there's a little bit of simplification in here. Wow, there it is symbolically. I'm not going to pull out my TI Inspire, but I, I guess I'm still enamored by this. I still think it is absolutely incredible that a machine like the Inspire will give me that answer exactly symbolically. And if you're using the TI-84, that's fine too. There it is uh, yeah. numerically. Okay. It is, uh, it is impressive, that cast machine, for sure. Isn't it? Isn't it amazing? Now, at the top of the screen here, here's a nice AP calculus exam hint or, or, or that you can use, that your students can take advantage of. Um, I, I'm often asked this question. Uh, look, can students define a function or an expression or a value and then use that in other calculations? And the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. So yeah. what I've done here is I've defined this huge analytical expression for the slope as M. And there's my value for Y1. If I present that as part of my solution, then son of a gun, I can use that in any later expression any later presentation so i, I know, don't right know if the teachers out there caught that but that is a that's a huge and the students i think that's a huge advantage uh thinking about the simple 
how simple that equation is there because you decided to go ahead and define M and Y1 separately uh, before you put that equation of the tangent line together. That's, that's big. I think it is. And it would be fine, of course, to define these numerically as well. I just chose to do it symbolically. Um, sure. You know, where this often comes up, uh, Curtis, is in the calculated portion of the exam, where students are often presented with some complicated functions. And so they'll enter them once we hope correctly into their calculator, but maybe as part of the problem, they might have to take a look at a new function h of x, which is they define as f of x minus g of x. Well, if f is already given in the problem, whoops, I'm sorry about that, and g is already given in the problem, they don't have to write out h of x again. And they risk, the, the problem is they, they risk the chance of making an error if they try to write it out analytically. So sure. it's certainly okay to define values like this. It's okay to define functions and use them in a problem. So I don't think I could graph this by hand, but here's a, a technology enhanced graph. I'm sorry I didn't label this. I apologize for that. This is a graph of my y equal f of x. And this green is a, a graph of the tangent line. And when we get to Tom's portion of this, I think he's going to take a look at this and zoom in a little bit more close to x equal pi over 6. But that's kind of cool. Okay. And one more problem I'd like to try, Curtis. I, I like these problems too, where we, where we ask students to uh, solve a problem that involves a, a, an extra parameter. And we've seen a lot of these on the free response portion of the exam lately, uh, especially in, I'm gonna say AB6, where we're uh, given a function that involves a parameter like K or N, and students are asked to do something with that extra function. So here's one where F of X is equal to the sine of N, sine raised to the N power of X times the cosine of NX. And uh, that's the same value of N there, or asked to find the first derivative. So there's lots of little things going on here. I think there's actually a chain rule. So let's see here. I have to take the sine of nx times the derivative. Let's see, did I do this right? Of the cosine of nx. So the derivative of the outer function is minus the sine of x nx times the derivative of this inner function, which is just plain n plus the derivative of the sine raised to the n power. That's a power function, which is the outermost function. So n times the sine to the n minus one of x derivative of the inner function is the cosine. And okay, I just did a little bit of simplification and you might balk a little bit at this step, but that's kind of a cool trig identity to make this kind of look simple at the end. So that's a nice problem too, uh, again, that uses a parameter and an example of, I think, kinds of problems we've seen lately. Now, Tom is going to take a look at, I believe, at uh, some of these problems again numerically. But I, before we get to that, I'm going to switch over here, Curtis, and I'm going to take a look at, let's see if I can do this correctly. I'm going to take a look at the, the problem that we assigned for this week and a couple of the solutions. Okay? Real yeah, quick. I think that's really good. Okay. By the way, while you're getting ready to do that, Steve, I just want to, I'm going to put a little plug in out there. We have posted these problems uh, on our bulletin board um, post for this Monday night calculus series. Um, just a reminder, we put that in the blog, in the um, comments link. We'll put it in there again here shortly. Um, there is a link there that you can get to all of these Monday night calculus sessions, both the previously recorded ones and these live sessions that we're going to be doing and the problem sets. Each week we'll be posting up the new problem set, or I should say every other week we'll be posting up the problem set for the coming, uh, for the upcoming session of Monday Night Calculus and the solutions to last week's one. So uh, the solutions for tonight's session will be up uh, sometime later this week. Very good. All right, so I'll go through these kind of quickly because I know our participants have been working on these and just want to check their answers. This number one is kind of a typical sort of a problem in an AP calculus class that involves a derivative of a trig function. We've got f equal to 2x sine x. We want to find an equation of a line tangent to the graph at this point. And I want to illustrate this with a little bit of technology here. I want to get the TI Inspire in this, and Tom may do this with the 84. I'm not sure. So here's the derivative of this function. 
in order to find that, whoops, I've got to use, I've got to use the product rule. There's the derivative. Little bit of simplification. I'm going to find the slope of the tangent line. This simplifies very nicely to just two. Hey, who picked this problem to work out that way? And here's an equation of the line tangent nicely to the graph done, at this author. point. <laughs> here's an equation of that tangent line. And I apologize. I, oh, I think I did get this added in here. This simplifies also very nicely to just y equal 2x. Um, one, one other question that I frequently get, Curtis, I'm sorry, I'm going to underline this over here. If we were to ask the student on the AP exam for the equation of a line tangent to the graph at this point, can they leave it like that? And the answer is absolutely yes. They can, but I'm going to scribble off to the side. They cannot write this. Why, oops, I'm sorry. We might have talked about this before. Y minus pi divided by X minus pi over 2 is equal to 2. Remember, they cannot leave their equation of the tangent line like that. And we'll leave it at that. <clears throat> I think we talked about that once before. And I think down, you at, did. I down think at you the did. bottom here, I've got a graph in the same viewing window. Uh, the blue is the graph of my y equal f of x. The green is the equation of the tangent line. You'll notice here a couple of things about the inspire. That's the way that I typed in the function uh, for f2 of x. It's interesting that the inspire did not simplify that to just 2x, but that's okay. And I actually placed a point on the graph at the uh, at the at the tangent line here and notice that it gives me that point up here numerically. So that's kind of cool. I think this emphasizes a point that we've talked about a couple of times already tonight, uh, sort of uh, verifying, supporting numerically, visually, graphically here, what we did analytically and that's kind of cool. Yep. All right, here's another nice one. And I think again, that this is a terrific AP calculus problem. Um, I wish uh, I had done this a little bit differently in retrospect, but uh, a, a better AP calculus problem would be a table of values for F and F prime, that's selected values of X. So you'll see why I think uh, that would make this even better when we get to the end. But boy, this is a pretty, pretty typical one. Here's a function f. I know its value at a particular point. I know the value of the derivative another at uh, pi over 3 also. Here's three other functions, g, h, and j, defined in terms of f. And j is actually defined in terms of g and h. And I want to find the derivative at pi over 3. So to find the derivative of g down here, I've got to use the product rule. Remember, we're just checking our answers here. I'm not going to go through this in gory detail. I plugged in a pi over 3 here, and I believe that's the answer that I got symbolically. Uh, Allison, if you could ask any of our participants if they can back me up on that, if anybody can support that they got that same answer. His h prime of x, <clears throat> once again, uh, h was defined, let's see, I'm going to arrow back up there in terms of the cosine and f, and I'm going to have to find the derivative there using the quotient rule. Great AP calculus question. There it is. A common error here, not so much here, but where that squared is placed in the denominator. Be careful of that, especially if you have some sort of a polynomial. I have to evaluate h at pi over 3, and I did so. That's what I got for a symbolic answer. Pretty cool. Um, I'm going to circle this and remind everybody once again that final numerical answers do not need to be simplified uh, on the AP exam, but not necessarily in my class. Here's the cool one. Find the derivative of j of x, which is a composition, g of h of x. And let's see if I've done this correctly here. G prime of H of X, take the derivative of the outermost function working your way inside times the derivative of the inner function H prime of X. Okay, I'm gonna hold that in abeyance for a second and looking ahead, I know I need to find H prime of three. I know when I plug in, pardon me, a pi over three, I know when I plug that in, I'm gonna to have to find that. And so I did that as sort of an aside and I got minus one eighth out of that. I did that by looking back at the definition of H up above. So G, J prime of go. pi over three is this expression. <whistles> Holy Toledo. 
I know that h of pi over three is minus <clears throat> one eighth. I just got that from up above. h prime of pi over three, this is the answer that I got in part b, I believe. And this is my final answer. And you'll notice here that I had to leave that in terms of f of minus one eighth and f prime of minus one eighth. And again, because I didn't provide values for those two expressions, but that's where I think a nice table of values would even enhance yeah. this problem even more. But that's a, that's a nice problem, which I think our teachers could uh, enhance a little bit, add a little bit and make it even better for their students. And here's one more. Yeah, I like that adaptation, that suggested adaptation. That's good. I think so. Um, just a heads up, Steve, they, they are supporting you, uh, both Fun Fernando it. and Rodrigo, <laughs> okay. uh, verified your answers. Uh, up ahead. Up okay, above. great. And here's the last one. I think this is a nice one too. This is a particle motion problem, a particle moving along a horizontal line so that its position for t greater than or equal to zero is given by this expression. We want to find the first value for t for which the particle is rest is at rest. Well, the very first thing I th might think about is our students have to know what does that mean? They have to know how to translate these words into mathematics. What does that mean in terms of S of T, V of T, A of T, derivatives, acceleration, velocity? And I'm gonna sneak down here and circle this. That means we have to find places at the first time T when the velocity is equal to zero. So I'm gonna to have to find the velocity, which is the derivative of the position S prime of T. Let's see, to find the derivative here, I've got to use the product rule. The derivative of the sine of T is the cosine of T. This is a little bit of a tricky step here, maybe from here, oh, pardon me, from here down to here. This is okay. I see the cosine squared minus the sine squared of T. But this step is a little tricky. Let me just talk through what I did there and why I did it. Um, in order for me to solve this expression, v of t is equal to zero, I, my thinking is looking ahead, I'm going to have to try to factor v completely. And so what I did is I used a trig identity here on sine squared of t, which is one minus the cosine of squared of t. I tried to get everything in terms of cosine. So I think I did that correctly, and I was able to factor there's a four out in front here. I think I was able to factor everything. That's kind of cool. This is factored in terms of the cosine of T. That's a valuable skill, I think, for our students. And so I use the principle of zero products here. How do you find when the velocity of zero? Well, when one of the factors is zero and the cosine of T is equal to minus one half. The first place that happens is two pi over three. When is the cosine equal to one? Remember greater than zero is what it asked in the problem. So this is when T is equal to two pi. So the value of T that we're looking for is two pi over three. I have in my notes that there's a nice way to show this graphically. And I think it turns out that Tom is going to be able to start off by showing that to you graphically. Tom, can I stop sharing and hand it over to you? No, you can't. Hold oh, on. Okay. <laughs> okay. So two, th two things brought, were brought up in that last one. A couple of people mentioned the Pythagorean identity and, and to factor it. But uh, somebody mentioned, uh, Alejandro mentioned in your problem that was just before this one um, yes. about G prime at negative one eighth being unknown. Does that give a problem there? Well, um, gee, well, we have to assume, okay, we, first of all, we have to assume that the derivative exists. We have to assume that the F exists at minus one eighth. We have to assume that F prime exists at one eighth. But G prime, I think we found up above here. There it is. There's the expression for G prime right here. Oh, there it is. Okay. And so I think what I did was I took that minus one eighth and I plugged it into that expression. That's this giant okay. thing right here. Okay, that's what I want to do uh, to just verify because um, I think I missed that uh, a little bit. Okay, okay, Tom, now you can start sharing. <laughs> I give you full permission. <laughs> okay, all right, Tom, here we go. There it is. Okay. Uh, that looks good. Can you hear me okay? And can you see my 84 screen? 
I can see your 84 screen just great. Okay, all right. Well, I'd like to pick up with just uh, what Steve was looking at uh, because um, the last part of this problem had to do with uh, motion along a horizontal line. Uh, and uh, when we think of parametric plotting on uh, 84 or Inspire or other graphing calculators, we usually think of parametric motion in the plane, but I like to use parametric uh, plotting for rectilinear motion, rectilinear meaning just along a single straight line. Uh, a way we can do that is uh, we, let's see, we're usually in function plot. So let me change my mode here uh, to, you know, if I could get radian on there and from function to parametric. All right. And then I'll go to the Y equals menu and there we see it's set up for parametric. We're just going to go along a horizontal line. I'm gonna actually fill in Y first. Now I'm just gonna make Y equal to one. So we're moving along the horizontal line, Y equal one. And then for X one of T, I'm gonna enter uh, the function that uh, uh, Steve had in his problem. So that, let's see, that was four times the cosine of T times the sine of T And then I think it was minus four sine t. You can check if I've got the uh, right function here. Okay. And we've got that set up. And now let me go to uh, the window. So we've got the entered and the window. This is where we set up our. Uh, settings for uh, not only the X and Y dimensions, but also the uh, interval for T. I'm gonna go ahead and make the uh, T interval. Uh, well, it's, here it's uh, zero to 6.28. Um, let me go ahead and make that uh, about 12.56. And the T step, I think that's probably, what is that, pi over, it's probably some multiple of pi. And I'll tell you what, let me go ahead and put in my own value. How about pi over 24? Okay. And let's go ahead and graph that. Oh, look at that. That's what the two-step was. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's take a look at the graph here. Uh, and that moved pretty fast. All I right. was going to say that doesn't look, that's not very exciting graph there, Tom. No, like it's not. Line. So that's where the trace is really nice. So if I turn on the trace, it's giving me uh, the, well, I can see at least part of the <laughs> equation for X. Uh, but now as I move my directional arrows, it's uh, the T values. I see uh, T values and the X values. Okay, so we're coming up to, it looks like it's turning around at about one point. Oh, we went a little bit further to the left, 2.09 something. And then it turned around and then we go, let's see, turned around again. So you can see the motion. In fact, the trace is kind of the best way to, to see the motion of the particle. Tom, there's yes. actually a really nice other option. If you go back to Y equals, and I don't know, I might be stealing your thunder a little bit here. An uh, arrow over, arrow to the left, um, onto X1 of T. Okay. And arrow, all, there you go, and press enter. And arrow down to the line and arrow around until you see a little ball with a line behind it. That like one. That? And press okay. okay. Now go back and press graph. All right. Ah, I like it. Very nice. That gives you kind of an automated uh, tracing, if you will, of, of the motion there, that particle motion. I love that. Right. So I wanted to actually go to that uh, first value that it turned around. 
and it looks like it's about 2.094951. So I, what I'm going to do is just uh, quit and let's see, I think, um, Steve calculated that it was two pi over three was the first time that uh, it turned around. Let's just right. see what that looks like. Oh, surprise, surprise. Okay, so the graph is carrying us out. That's exactly where we saw that first turnaround point. So I, I really like doing that for kind of confirmation purposes where you do that analytic work and then see, see the uh, proof of it out like that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, shall I just launch into some more stuff here? Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show people something I find incredibly powerful um, when I'm doing uh, trigonometric functions. And that's, uh, let me go ahead and get to the, uh, back to the mode. I'm gonna go back to function here. Go back to my y equals menu, and uh, what I'm going to uh, enter here is just the sine of x. And then I'm going to enter what's going to look like a kind of a bizarre looking function. So uh, it's going to be the sine of the quantity x plus this point 0.1 then minus sine of x and then that's all going to be divided by 0.1 and before I graph these I want to just kind of think through what what is that weird y2 well it's actually a difference quotient where the value of h or delta x whatever you want to call it is uh, small, but not too small. It's just point 0.1. So I did a diff sine of x plus point 0.1 minus sine of x divided by that difference of point 0.1. And what I'm curious is just kind of what does the graph of that look like compared to the original sine x? So let's take a look at the graph of both of these. Uh, and here we go. And I have to tell you, you know, the first time I did this on a graphing calculator, I actually was astonished. I, I, it actually surprised me. See, I didn't think that value of H was very small. Okay, that 0 0.1 seems pretty crude to me, but we get an <laughs> amazingly good cosine look there. So, so that's just kind of going back to the first principles. Well, what is the definition of derivative? And for me, this is kind of this uh, numerical evidence that, uh, that that calculation of cosine X being exactly the derivative of sine X makes sense. Here, even with a crude value of h, we get something very close. Tom, uh, somebody's asking in the chat uh, what, what we were discussing a little while ago, uh, I think, and that is, can you estimate this derivative numerically using a table of values? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that has to do, Curtis, help me a little bit with that command we were talking about, delta list. I think that's where Tammy was going with this. And yeah, absolutely. That's what I alluded to at the very beginning. Is that's a, that is another way to sort of guess at what the derivative of any function is, but the sine of x in this particular case. Yeah, absolutely. Case. You could do a table of values using the list. Yeah. Yep. Excellent yeah. point. And that's a really nice, that's a really nice way to get at it. I like using the table. Again, that's a, you know, you're addressing it from another point of view, right? We've got this analytical thing that we're doing. We've got this graphical thing that we're doing. Now we can do it with a table and numerically approaching it that way. I like that. Um, I'm going to switch over here a little bit to the Inspire, and uh, I think I've got something set up here for us to take a look at. Um, in Inspire, um, you know, you can set up actually a split screen, and this is actually kind of hammering home again that connection between sine x and its derivative cosine x. Um, what I set up here is, uh, here's a graph of sine x, uh, and I've actually got a point that I can move with this little clicker slider here. And so that's moving along the sine x curve. And it's got a tangent line through that point as I move it. Um, the slope of this line 
is the y value that's being plotted down here for exactly the same x value. So these two x values will always be the same. That's what I'm incrementing over here. So up here, 1.5708, oh, that looks like a fairly familiar decimal number. Uh, it's about a horizontal tangent line. And there's, owing to the numerical thing, we get something very, very close to zero down here. And so this is plotting out, again, this is bringing in uh, this general idea to graph a derivative, what you're doing is you're plotting slope values for each X value. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a pretty powerful illustration of what's going on. Uh, for Tom, sure, can I can make that visual connection pretty nicely uh, looking at the slope of that tangent line, noting that it's positive, being able to kind of recognize that and see the changes in that red graph down below. That's, that's really nice. Tom, I don't want to put you on the spot. I have two questions, maybe just comments we can make about this. Sure. Is uh, one thing... Uh, uh, we can do here on the Inspire now is, correct me if I'm wrong, can't we change our tick marks or tick labels so that they are multiples of pi if we really wanted to? And uh, yeah, I think so. And we can actually see those, uh, you know, if we went pi, which is kind of cool. You don't have to do that, but that's something okay. we mentioned. And the other thing is in this kind of a, in this kind of an application, um, it's certainly possible, isn't it, to change uh, the function f1, right? And everything is done dynamically updated so that we could guess at the derivative of other functions using this app, couldn't we? Uh, yeah, let me think here. Um, you know, I think I've got this one set up specifically for sine x. Sine? Okay. Uh, and that's because I actually referred to sine x and cosine x. What I should have done is refer to F1 and F2. F2. Gotcha. And then whenever yeah. I updated F1, it would have just updated, yeah. Gotcha, okay, thanks so, Tom. Uh, I kind of whipped this together on the fly. And so <laughs> I took the shortcut of just referring to sign, but you're right, that's that's an, just as easy to refer to F1 and then it updates for any function. Yeah, that's a nice feature. In, which is really nice. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. And you could, you know, the nice thing is, Tom, and I noticed you're working on the cast machine here too. You can actually, you know, you can put that derivative in there as the as F2. And then really all you have to do is change F1 and really you can start to see those, that conversation mm -hmm. happening. That's wow. cool. Um, that's something that was kind of a, uh, when I was first using graphing calculators and teaching calculus, I think it was uh, one of the first big aha moments I had uh, where I, I actually thought my calculator was doing something uh, faulty or is in error. Um, but then I had a lesson in chain rule. So I thought it might uh, take a look at that. Um, I'm going to go to the 84 here and just go ahead and quit back out of the graph. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, just do a uh, numerical derivative for sine x. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. See if we've got math. There's the numerical derivative down there, number eight, derivative with respect to x of the sine of x. And let's look at the value of that at x equals zero. And let's see, drum roll, what should we get? What's the slope of the graph of sine x at y equals sine x at x equals zero? Oh, it's a numerical derivative. Right, okay, so very close to one, okay. Uh, here's where I had a, an aha moment is uh, if uh, for some reason I had been doing some work and I happened to be in degree mode. This is a really common thing on an exam or you know things of yeah. that nature. This happens a lot, right? To students, they come in because they've been using another calculator, another class for other things, and they're in degree mode. Yeah, I calculate that exact same derivative, and I get a very different value. Right. But if we think about what this derivative is, if x is being measured in degrees, this should be how fast does the values of sine x change per increment of one degree. 
right? That's going to be a lot smaller value. And here's a kind of a cute thing. I mean, the graph of y equals sine x looks a lot like the graph of y equals x at the origin. Kind right. of a precursor to our next Monday night calculus topic about local linearity. Uh, if that's true, I wonder if this is very close to one degree in radians. Well, let's see. I'm gonna take pi, divide by 180. How about, how about Ooh, divide by about 180? Dividing. That would be better, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the division symbol's on the other yeah, side. Yeah, there we go. How about pi divided by 180? Ah, there we go. There's the pi. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. So now you could actually go back in and do that exploration uh, with right. that composition of functions. That's cool. And if you happen to have a CAS and you, uh, uh, do this, uh, let me see, let me get the derivative template up here. The derivative of sine x is cosine x. Yeah. Now I'm going to change from radians to degrees. Do it again. And there's that factor hey. pi over 180 popping out, which that was the thing that kind of set me back. And, and then I realized, that, wow, that's exactly makes sense when we're in degree mode. Yeah. Right. Right. I think that's a, that's a really cool example. What a neat way to, to have your students think about that. Uh, uh, that degrees versus radians, that kind of input. We, we memorize a lot of these things in terms of radians, um, you know, and I think that's, a, that's cool. And uh, I think one last uh, moment, I don't know whether I call this an aha moment or a duh moment. <laughs> so I'm going to hearken back uh, to one of uh, Steve's uh, examples again. Let me just uh, go ahead and insert a graph. And um, what I'm going to look at is, let's go ahead and graph those. Was it 2x times cosine uh, sine x was one of Steve's examples. Okay. And I think he, let's see, did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then I think uh, y equal 2x was the tangent line at a particular point. So let right. me go ahead and uh, graph that also. Ah, there it is. And I think it was uh, tangent at pi over 2 comma pi. So that makes sense there. Right. So there mm -hmm. we have that uh, nice tangent line graph. And again, early on when I was using graphing calculators in calculus, I thought, you know what would be cool is zoom in on that point of tangency and kind of see how those two things compare. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we'll do uh, Oops. Okay. You want to be in under the zoom button there. Yeah. There, you go. there we go. And I'm going to just do a zoom in and I'll just get her close to that point of tangency there. All right. And I just keep zooming in, zooming in. And you zoom in enough, actually you don't see two graphs, you only see one. <laughs> yeah. so, but that's the dumb moment is, oh, of course, it's uh, the, the graph of the function and the graph of its tangent line should become indistinguishable up close. That's mm -hmm. what uh, it means to be differentiable. And that's a really powerful property that up close these functions behave linearly. That is one of the best uh, things about using technology to be able to view these things too, is that kind of interaction and being able to view that. I mean, can you imagine, you'd have to trust your own pencil and paper. Uh, <laughs> oh to yeah. Draw in there and, and have that actually uh, do before you were able to, to do this with technology. So I think this is really, this is really big and, and getting students to be able to see that and understand.
In fact, that was a point I wanted to make, Curtis, uh, that I, I uh, didn't make with the, uh, that difference quotient example. The sine of x plus 0.1 minus sine of x all over 0.1, you would never graph that with paper pen. I mean, it would be- Right, yeah. You'd be using a calculator, a scientific calculator, um, Buku times just to get one function pair value, and you'd be doing that for several points. That you would lose the forest for the trees. Yeah. Right, right. But the ability to be able to do that quickly and visualize it really quickly yeah, and concentrate on what you're seeing right now. Very cool. Well, I think that's about all I've got. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing and turn it back over. Well, that's really great. Come on. <laughs> Thanks, Tom, for the lead-in for our next uh, our next week our next topic. Uh, local linearity. I think that's going to be, uh, you know, you set us up really nicely there, Tom. So um, I just want to point out one more time uh, before uh, I thank these guys for uh, hanging out with us and, and doing some calculus and sharing their wisdom uh, that we do have um, the links to um, this session, our previous ones and the future coming ones are in that bulletin board post. We've put it up in the, in the chat a couple times. And also the, the solutions for this week's set of problems that Steve worked, uh, along with the uh, next set of problems that you could take out and assign to your students um, and have them working on. And then we certainly want to um, go ahead and encourage you teachers um, who are out there watching tonight to, to um, get your students involved in this and have them attend on Monday nights as well. I think this information that Steve and Tom are, are putting together is a great opportunity uh, for them also to ask questions of these guys. I know um, the chat was a little quiet tonight, but we certainly encourage you guys to um, you know, and interact with us and ask questions, pause us, tell us, um, hey, I didn't grab that or I've got this comment or whatever. We certainly encourage that kind of uh, intercommunication. We look forward to seeing you guys in a couple of weeks uh, and talking about local linearity. So Steve and Tom, thanks a whole bunch for uh, hanging out with us tonight, doing a little bit of calculus. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. All Thank right. you very much. Thanks, Curtis. All right. Good night, guys. Clear.